Good morning, sub bros and sub gals. Thank you for joining us for another episode of Sub Bro Sessions. Today, we again scrub up and go back into the operating room for part two of our Sub Bro Trauma Center series, where we diagnose common symptoms of ailing Sub Bro claims and discuss ways to treat them back to health. The topic for part two of our series is A Long Way From Home, Pursuing Claims Against Foreign Entities. In our modern interconnected world of commerce, we often find that a potentially liable party, sometimes the only liable party, is a foreign entity. This is especially true in product liability cases where the manufacturer is a foreign entity. For attorneys and adjusters alike, upon discovering that we have a foreign entity in our crosshairs, the first reaction is usually an audible groan. Pursuing foreign entities adds several layers, often thick ones, to any subrogation pursuit. Some see it as a dead end. Others see it as a potentially too costly of an endeavor. Oftentimes, the presence of a foreign entity leads to a closed file. Today, we'll be discussing how we can explore those files before throwing in the towel. We will look at common factors to consider with foreign entities, means of pursuit available to us, and some laws that apply. We'll, be, we'll also be providing examples from our own experiences. So let's get started. As always, with me today are the two Robins to my Batman, Matt Ferry and Gus Sara. Say hello, gentlemen. Hello, everyone. Uh, this is Matt Ferry. Great to be back with our loyal listeners again. And uh, Leon, you mentioned Robin. In all candor, I did play Robin at least twice for Halloween when I was a kid. I love Robin, but I, when I think about it, I think we're more the Alfred to your Batman. I think we're the ones who are calmly telling you what you're about to do is a mistake. <laughs> Regardless, I'm the debonair Batman. <laughs> cool story, bro. Gus Sarah here at your service. Uh, thanks for joining us again. All right, great. Let's get started. So Gus is going to first start us off here and talk about some ways to identify and research the targets. Right. So like any subro case, uh, the first step is identifying the target. Uh, you conduct the scene investigation. You determine that, um, you know, what your potential ignition sources were in a fire or the origin point for the water loss. And uh, typically, if it's a products case, you identify the product and then you've got to um, uh, determine who makes the product, who sold the product, who distributes the product. And things start to go south when you find out that your main target, the, the seller, the manufacturer or distributor is a foreign entity outside the reach of US. And obviously, when you get into the component manufacturers, that can also come up later on uh, where you think you have the main target and they are a US company. But uh, it turns out that the component that failed is a foreign entity that the US uh, uh, seller wants to bring in as well. You know, even if you think that you have all U.S. entities, uh, your reality could change as you uh, conduct the evidence exam or get deeper into the analysis. So once you find the target and it's a foreign entity, obviously you want to figure out where they're located, the size of the company, and its presence in the U.S. market and its relationship with the U.S. market. Uh, that is one of the, the top considerations when you're analyzing whether or not to move forward against a foreign entity. I have found in my experience that the more obscure uh, foreign entities that don't do a whole lot of work or are small component manufacturers uh, and they don't, they don't do a whole lot of work in the U.S. market, they may be more evasive. They may be less willing to cooperate. They may be less willing to immediately respond to your notice letter, and you may have to actually engage a company in that country to assist with locating that entity and getting them to cooperate. And in some instances, you even have to perhaps have a law firm out there try to entice uh, that entity to cooperate. And then in that case, things can get expensive. But with the larger foreign entities, large manufacturers who have a lot of business in the U.S., there's usually an interest for them to cooperate. 
If you want to maintain a good, healthy relationship uh, with the U.S. markets, you probably don't want to have a lot of unanswered claims or even default judgments to the extent that that you can get service on them. So, so those companies, in my experience, they tend to cooperate. Uh, some large manufacturers, such as dehumidifier manufacturers uh, that have recently issued recalls on some of their dehumidifier units, have designated U.S. counsel that are essentially uh, there for claimants to submit claims, to place uh, on notice, uh, and that makes it really convenient. Uh, some of the larger foreign manufacturers uh, have U.S. Uh, uh, locations. They could be sales offices, distribution offices, and some even have U.S. affiliates uh, that will accept uh, or acknowledge a notice and uh, par- participate in the investigation. In those cases, uh, it's it's a much more likely situation uh, or, or or much more favorable to to a subrogation recovery if you could develop a good theory of liability against them. It's the more obscure, the smaller companies, the ones that have less of a presence in the U.S. or are less concerned with maintaining a healthy relationship uh, with the U.S. market uh, that becomes more challenging and and may lead you down a, a road of having to try to file suit or serve uh, through the Hague Convention if that's an option that is available. All right, great. Well, once you've identified research your target, the next step is to place them on notice. Matt? So when you're talking about placing some of these, uh, as Gus mentioned, obscure companies, companies that are not interested in maintaining a good relationship with the U.S., uh, not overly interested in accountability, I mean, there's several options where you can try to place them on notice. The issue is whether or not you're going to get any response. Certainly, you can use whatever international mail addresses you can find on a website uh, for that company or just any website that can reference that company and contact information. You may be able to find an email address for that company. If they have a website, they may have an online contact form you can fill out to try to get in touch with that company. Uh, Oftentimes, there may be a fax number you can use. This assumes, of course, they do not have a U.S. location or U.S. presence, which does make it a lot easier. In my experience uh, with these companies who really don't want to be accountable for their product and really uh, are not interested in what we're trying, in, in us trying to get their attention, is you're just ignored. And you, you pretty much have to continue your, invest, continue your investigation as best you can, uh, placing them on notice, making them aware of any joint site inspections, any joint evidence exams. For me, I would say that uh, for some of these more, more, more obscure companies or companies not interested in maintaining that relationship uh, with, uh, with the U.S., uh, if I'm contacted at all, I'm, I'm often contacted by a foreign insurance carrier for that company who typically has a close relationship with that company and will be of some assistance in moving forward. Well, the next step and we're going to talk about here is actually filing suit against foreign entities. So that means that I am up and I'm going to talk about what's called long arm statutes and how they relate to personal jurisdiction. So for the non-lawyer listeners out there, this can be some dense stuff. This is, you know, the uh, you do, topics, of, <laughs> <laughs> topics of civil procedure 101. And for our, our lawyer listeners, you know that this is the stuff of law school nightmares. So either way, we're going to do our best to keep it simple. So first of all, let's just kind of define what is personal jurisdiction. So essentially, that is the ability for a court uh, to compel jurisdiction over a defendant. Um, And there's two general ways you do this. One is through what's called general jurisdiction, and one is through what's called specific jurisdiction. Again, for the lawyers out there, this, you know, rings out name case names you learned your first year of law school, like Asahi Metal Industry and International Shoe, which I always thought may be a good band name. Um, <laughs> but, you know, if you don't remember all that, let's take a quick look at that. So general jurisdiction is essentially when a company, a corporation has what's called continuous and systematic contacts with that particular forum. Um, you know, if that's a state court, uh, what have you. And those are, you know, two words you'll see often in cases and analysis is continuous and systematic contacts. So, you know, generally for a U.S. corporation that you're pursuing, it's no problem. I mean, if they're a manufacturer these days in the U.S. and they're distributing throughout, um, it shouldn't be a problem that they're going to have jurisdiction, especially with the larger manufacturers. When is that a problem? Well, 
when we're talking about foreign companies, it's it's generally a problem that they may not have general jurisdiction if it's a foreign company that has little contact with the U.S. or if it, if you're trying to reach a foreign parent company of another company in the U.S. for whatever reason. Oftentimes, the parent companies abroad will purposely be set up, you know, separately and distinct with walls between them um, so that there's not, you know, continuous and, and systematic contacts with whatever company is has a presence in the U.S. And trying to what is called pierce the corporate veil on that is very difficult. It's not impossible. And if it truly is, you know, a, a shell company abroad, it can be done. But again, courts are going to look at very fact-specific analysis to determine whether or not that's possible. And if not, they're oftentimes are shielded from general jurisdiction and can't be compelled in U.S. courts. The other kind of jurisdiction is specific jurisdiction, which is not something we really need to get too much into because if you have specific jurisdiction, which is essentially a specific act in that forum that leads to the harm, it's pretty obvious. It's pretty clear. And, you know, almost always, I don't even think would be brought up by the other side, you know. So what we're looking at really here is general jurisdiction. Okay, so long arm statutes, what are they? These are statutes that states create to, they essentially are creating their own ability to compel jurisdiction over out-of-state defendants. Obviously, that includes foreign ones. Um, so they're doing this through statutory means. And this is essentially a tug of war between the due process clause of the 14th Amendment. I know, now we're getting into amendments, so I'll I'll take pump the brakes. <laughs> Yikes, Leon, <laughs> slow it down. Slow it down. Right, right. So we're not going to get into a class of, you know, the due process for, uh, clause of the 14th Amendment. I'll just say this. Uh, essentially, the due process clause is trying to restrain what's unreasonable. We all know generally what due process is. Long arm statutes are trying to give states the ability to reach these defendants, whether they're out of state or abroad in what we're talking about today, and compel them into their courts. And the due process clause of the 14th Amendment is kind of creating this barrier from them doing that. Checks and balances, that's what we're all about, right? So that the states cannot overreach, and the 14th Amendment is there to ensure that. So when we're looking at long-arm statutes, the trend of states creating their long-arm statutes is to keep them broad and general so that they are able to compel, which is, makes sense. It's in their interest that these states create statutes for their own courts to compel these defendants there. So take a quick look at, a, at one long arm statute and specifically I'm talking about Illinois. And Illinois has been fodder for um, you know some of the litigation over long arm statutes, so it's a good one. Uh, when we're talking about general jurisdiction, things that Illinois says that is very typical of other states that elicit general jurisdiction are transactions of the business within the state, commission of tortious acts, ownership of use of real estate, contracting, uh, insuring. So it, it really, and, and it goes on and on. So it's really broad, which gives, you know, is good for us. It gives the attorney or the adjuster the ability to really reach out to these foreign entities and compel them for jurisdiction to that state court. Of course, that's where the checks and balances come in. So we've had some Supreme Court cases, and again, I won't get too into the weeds on them, but in 2011, two big ones came out in, in the U.S. Supreme Court. One is J. McIntyre Machinery. Um, and essentially, this Another is a, good band. Yeah, band. there you go. That's right. <laughs> this is a case from uh, the great state of New Jersey, my home and current state, Gus's home state that he's since shunned, um, <laughs> which essentially... The quick facts on this one are that someone was the plaintiff was injured using a metal shearing machine that was produced in England. Okay, so he tries to bring a products liability case in New Jersey where the accident occurred and the distributor tries to avoid jurisdiction. What the plaintiff is arguing based their, their jurisdiction on is that the distributor or I'm sorry, the, the manufacturer used a distributor to distribute in the States. He went to, I believe, a few trade shows, but not New Jersey. And there was no more than four machines ending up in New Jersey. So Supreme Court said, that's enough. You They have jurisdiction. You, ha you can proceed. Supreme Court said, no, it's not. That's not enough. And they said that they do not have jurisdiction. And it does violate 
the due process clause of the 14th Amendment, which, as we discussed, is the kind of check and balance there. Next case in the same year, a North Carolina case, Goodyear Dunlap Tires versus Brown. All right. This one involves two boys from North Carolina who died in a bus accident in France and then tried to bring suit in North Carolina. Essentially, what happened here was that it was a defective tire that was designed, constructed, and tested in Turkey and had subsidiaries Turkey in Turkey, Luxembourg, and France. Now, these companies uh, generally marketed for sale in the European and Asian markets, not U.S., but a small percentage were distributed to North Carolina through affiliates. So North Carolina State Court said, yes, that's enough. It's through the stream of commerce. You have jurisdiction. You can bring those foreign foreign entities into our courts. Supreme Court came in and again said, no, it's not. There is no jurisdiction. All right. Last one I'll talk about is one that we're still waiting to see how the Supreme Court's going to decide. And this is a Pennsylvania case. The facts in this one don't really matter too much. I'll just say that it is a uh, Virginia plaintiff or resident bringing a case against a Virginia corporation in Pennsylvania. And the basis of this is that under Pennsylvania law, they say a foreign corporation may not do do business in this commonwealth until it registers, registers with the Department of State of the Commonwealth. So essentially they're saying, if you want to do business here, you need to register with Pennsylvania, any kind of business. And if you're registered with Pennsylvania, the courts say, that's enough. You have general jurisdiction. So essentially they're kind of doing away in this in this statute with any of the analysis for the continuous and systematic context because they're saying you do business, you register, you have jurisdiction. The Supreme, the Pennsylvania Supreme Court said, nope, that, that, that violates due process. So that would also apply, obviously, to any out of state, whether it's foreign or national. So we're waiting to see what the Supreme Court says on that. The overall takeaway is the long arm statutes that the states are creating are trying their best to expand, to give us general jurisdiction over these foreign entities so we can bring them into the courts. And the courts are kind of responding by trying to limit and to respect the due process clause. Now, lastly, I'll end with this. Why is that relevant? It's relevant because as you're going to see in Gus's next uh, uh, section here, pursuing a foreign entity is complicated, can be time consuming, can be expensive. You want to figure out as early as you can if these companies can even be compelled into our courts. Oftentimes they can, but sometimes they can't. And it's something you know really to be aware of before we go to the next step, which leads me to Gus. Right. So once you've established that you you know you have a good argument for for jurisdiction, uh, you still have to serve the entity, and th- that becomes very tricky when you're dealing with a foreign entity uh, with no agent of service in the U.S. You typically have to. A, a lot of countries, especially China, are members of the Hague Convention, uh, which is which provides a a process. Uh, for you to actually assert a claim and serve the process papers onto the foreign entity. And there are companies that kind of, you know, do the soup to nuts uh, handling of the Hague Convention process, which includes uh, translating the the complaint or the, the filing documentation into the language of the nation where the foreign entity is located filing the appropriate forms with the appropriate international entities, and then assisting with the uh, actual service of process in that country. The entire process, uh, last time I did it, uh, was over $3,000. It, it cost just just to translate it and file the forms and, and, and um, you know, and hire a service company uh, in that in that foreign nation. So you've got to you've got to consider whether or not it's cost effective, and whether or not you think you're going to be able to even locate this entity. It helps to know that you were able to at least get get them service uh, if you got a return receipt from the international mail, or if you got an acknowledgement uh, uh, from an email or a fax that you sent. If you know that they're at least there and they're still in business, and you know the the, the loss is large enough. Uh, it, it might. It wasn't. It wasn't the most painstaking process, and the last time I did it, um, it took about six months from filing of the complaint 
to completing service on the foreign entity. So it wasn't a, a, a quick ordeal, uh, but we ended up serving the entity. And once we did, within two weeks, we got a call from a U.S. lawyer and we were able to settle the case at a mediation six months later. And this was, it wasn't a very commonly known company. Uh, I'd never heard of the company. They were a manufacturer of a water valve, uh, a water pipe valve. Uh, and we had determined uh, through the metallurgy that this particular metal valve wasn't properly manufactured and that the manufacturer was, was a, a Chinese manufacturer. So we completed this process. We got an attorney and it turned out to be way worthwhile uh, because we got a very favorable settlement. So uh, the Hague Convention is something that works. It's worked for me. It's 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 definitely uh, a, a cost effective process if you have the right value of the claim, and it's something that that I think you that carriers should consider uh, before uh, quickly closing the file because a foreign entity is involved. So the case that Gus just discussed is is a great case scenario because yes the the the, uh, the upfront cost that would have to be incurred for service you know, it wound up being made up several times over, and a lot of times it is worth a shot to at least try serving through the Hague Convention. But it is important to remember that it probably will be a two or three thousand dollar cost, and on top of that, it's a slow process. It's a and it's a cumbersome process serving through the Hague Convention, and there's no real mechanism for you to kind of track when service is going to happen. One day you're just going to find out that it did happen. You're not really given much warning and you're not really given much of a sense of it will happen in the next few weeks. It will happen in the next month. Anything, anything along those lines. So the, when we talk about why we're serving any foreign entities through the Hague Convention, a lot of times it's because we are under the impression that we cannot collect or we're not certain that we can collect from the local U.S. distributor of the product. And when we talk about the local U.S. distributor, what we're typically talking about is strict products liability. And traditionally, that is the concept where a consumer can pursue the local seller uh, in strict liability. That means we would not have to prove that the local seller was involved in the design or manufacture of the product where the defect um, you know, became involved. But if you, you could pursue a local seller if they are a seller in the business of selling, if the product is defective, and if, if it reached the consumer in substantially the same condition as when it left the possession of the seller. And when you think about it, that makes a lot of sense because typically that local distributor, they have the relationship with the manufacturer. They have profited from that relationship. It's not their store that suffered fire damage or burned down. And the law has basically said many times over, it's the seller that should bear the responsibility for that damage if it is difficult or impossible to pursue the manufacturer. While that has traditionally been a way that a plaintiff can go, there have been some aspects of that area of the law that have been weakened over time. One of them is called the sealed container doctrine. And that really kind of uh, takes out the heart of what strict liability, liability is. The sealed container doctrine says that a seller, if all they do is receive a sealed product and sell it, without having any opportunity to inspect it and without having knowledge of the defect, they cannot be held responsible. So now you're taking that concept of, of, the, of the seller being the person who's in the best position to bear the loss and you're getting rid of it and you're putting it back on the consumer who would now have to go directly against a manufacturer that may be very hard or almost impossible to serve and collect any type of judgment against. Now, even in jurisdictions where the sealed uh, container doctrine does exist, there are sometimes exceptions if the plaintiff can prove that the manufacturer cannot be served or is uh, insolvent or otherwise you can't get a judgment against them, the court oftentimes will allow you to pursue the local seller. But it's more, it's more hoops for the plaintiff to jump through that, frankly, they should not have to jump through. Another issue we face often, and this would be for a much longer podcast, is with entities like Amazon. The argument that they make as to why they cannot be held strictly liable is saying that they are not a seller. They do not equate themselves to the traditional brick and mortar store where the product used to be purchased. They equate themselves to a marketplace similar, similar to a flea market. I've never felt that that argument makes a lot of sense, particularly in the eyes of a, of a consumer. I have bought countless products from Amazon over the years, and not one time has a product that I bought on Amazon. If I had not bought on Amazon, would I have bought it at a flea market? The products that I buy on Amazon are products that I otherwise would have bought at Target or Best Buy or Lowe's. Brick and mortar stores. Amazon, from my consumer experience, has replaced or largely replaced brick and mortar stores for me. It has not replaced flea markets. But regardless, Amazon has had some success with that arguments. 
with with that argument, and that is why we often do what we can to pursue the foreign manufacturer as well. And Gus, I think you had an example of a discovery issue that you ran into when you were pursuing a foreign manufacturer in litigation. Yeah, so I've had cases uh, where multiple attorneys were involved, and there was a international manufacturer, but a U.S. seller and distributor. Uh, and uh, the decision was made amongst the attorneys to just sue the U.S. entities to not deal with the complications that we we're talking about uh, throughout this episode of pursuing a foreign entity. And we all agreed that there was sufficient jurisdiction and the law was sufficient to pursue the U.S. entities, even though they weren't actually the manufacturers, but they were the sellers and distributors of those of those products. We were in favorable jurisdictions to do that. We, we found out um, through discovery uh, that we were not able to get all the documentation, the schematics, the wiring schemes. My example is a uh, vehicle manufacturer, and uh, we were claiming that there was a particular wire that was too close to the battery and that overheated over time and, and caused the fire. What we learned is that the U.S. entity agreed that they would not c- try to dismiss the c- case if we didn't sue the the uh, foreign manufacturer uh, on grounds that they were not the manufacturer, so we were good on that front. But they did use that you know argument that they were not the foreign manufacturer when we were looking for uh, confidential or sensitive information regarding the design, assembly, and manufacturing of the vehicle. Now we were able to settle the case favorably. Anyway, but we did hit a few snags trying to, uh, you know, collect all the documentation that we needed for our expert to get a a good sense, a sufficient sense of how the vehicle uh, was supposed to be designed. So that's that's a lesson to be learned. Uh, If you have the opportunity to sue the foreign manufacturer and it's a complicated products case uh, that you may want to see, you know, how the sausage was made, uh, then you may want to consider bringing in the foreign entity uh, because you're going to be more privy to the actual manufacturing process as opposed to a U.S. seller saying, oh, well, that's not us and we can't give you that information. So that's similar to a case I had where we had a Korean manufacturer which had a U.S. subsidiary, same name, except you know the the entity was X company USA versus you know X company Korea, and we were aware that there could be an issue in if we o- if we only sued the American entity in terms of getting design and uh, manufacturing type documents. So we sued both. We got service right away on the American entity, and we tried to serve the Korean entity through the Hague Convention, which frankly was taking a very long time. And we got the response that we expected in discovery from the American entity, which is that they they can not produce design and manufacturing documents. They are a separate and distinct entity from the Korean entity. They don't have them. Frankly, it's it's an argument that you know, it doesn't really pass the smell test. And the pressure I had in my case was our judge did was not really keen on giving discovery extensions, even though there was not much we could do because the Korean entity had not yet been served. So ultimately, we asked for a discovery extension of six months, and the court only gave us two months. So at that point, what I did was I did a motion to compel and in the alternative, a motion to further extend deadlines. So about four years prior, uh, our, our firm had another case against this entity on their product liability action. And as that case progressed and there were documents produced regarding design and manufacture, when it t- came time for a corporate designee deposition, the Korean entity actually designated an employee of the American entity to be their designee to discuss the design and manufacture documents. So we actually included that in our motion to compel to sort of bring attention to the court that this argument being presented, that these are really separate and distinctly lent, is really kind of a game that this entity was playing. And the, 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 the relief we saw was basically to make the American entity provide these documents or in the, in the alternative, if the court was not inclined to do that, to grant another four-month extension because otherwise the documents weren't going to come in, weren't going to be produced because we still had not served the foreign entity. So after that motion was filed, I received a call directly from the foreign manufacturer. Um, in fact, the, the defense attorney had told me I might hear directly from the foreign manufacturer. And it was funny because they had a kind of like an aristocratic British accent, almost kind of sounded like a Bond villain. And they said, Mr. Ferry, do you really think you're the first attorney who's ever made this argument? <laughs> and I said, uh, 
I said, no, <laughs> no, I, I don't. But you know, the argument is valid or it's not. It seems like you guys are playing games and we need to find out if the court is going to let you play games. So as it turned out shortly afterward, I received a settlement offer um, from, from the American defendant that led to the case being settled. And, and I think what it really was is that entity did not want a court ruling that the American entity did not want that precedent that the American entity would have to provide those documents. But sometimes you just have to kind of lay it all out in front of the court and put the pressure on the defendant so they can stop playing some of these games. I like that accent. Sounds like your Alfred impression, which is a nice <laughs> full circle here. So as we're wrapping up, one one quick note, even if you, you know, if you are successful, keep in mind that, you know, anything dealing with foreign entities may take a little bit longer, maybe a little more complicated, including getting checks, getting paid. So, you know, keep that in mind that uh, you know, you might not get it in the amount of business days you would with a US company, just to give, you know, proper expectations all around. All right. Thanks for listening to this episode of Subro Sessions. Be sure to listen to the next episode of Subro Sessions, which will be released on the third Tuesday of next month, July 18th, 2023, in this case. You can find past episodes of the podcast and relevant case updates on the Subrogation Strategist blog, all available at whiteandwilliams.com. Thank you.